Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with his special Sunday guest, Mr. Ryan Nickel. How you doing, sir? Um, it's my pleasure. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Hey, man, one of the things I want to talk about, I have not talked about with any of my experts in all of the 6,000 plus videos we've done uh, in the last three years or so. You ready? I am. <laughs> so let's talk about real estate investing in the 1980s. Ooh. And why it's uh, similar to what I see coming here in the next uh, couple of years. So I know uh, I know you were too young to sign loan docs in the 80s, uh, but you certainly have done research and read about what was going on then. What, uh, what do you remember uh, about investing in real estate in the 80s? Oh, man. So this is, this is where, as you mentioned, you know, creative financing was actually born. Absolutely. Um, in mainstream. I mean, it had always been existing, but mainstream. So interest rates were so, so high that people could not afford to buy the house. And so what they were doing is they were buying the debt and then taking out seconds or, or paying off some of the equity and just taking over that existing uh, debt as it was, because who's going to qualify at like 18, 19% or would want to, Yeah, and we have, you know, interest rates at 12. Oh my God, at 12, we got to get this house today. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. I was gonna say, if, you, if you're accurate, if you're, if you're hundred percent accurate and we have, um, you know, Arthur Burns right now, 2.0 with uh, Jerome Powell, and we're going to get a, a a Paul Volcker coming in here and squash inflation. If it's not too late, then yes, we are seeing history repeat itself. And mm -hmm. I mean, for those that watch your channel and have seen your predictions and how spot on you are, this is scary to think that yeah. this could be accurate and we could be walking into, I mean, it's scary for the consumer. I think it's also, it's, it's for us, it's like, wow, we have our eyes wide open. We know we're walking into, we know how to navigate these waters, but for the most, for the general consumer that's out there, good night. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that's why I do it every day, because you just never know when when somebody's ears will be open and really absorb. So let's let's talk about that analogy of Arthur Burns and, and Paul Volk. Like, that is I'm trying to scare people with that. So most of you out there. Have, job. <laughs> yeah, yes. Most of you have no idea who Arthur Burns is. None. Zero. Some of you have heard Paul Volcker. Why is that? Well, Paul Volcker is credited rightly so with breaking the back of inflation in the early 1980s. How did he do it? Well, he took the Fed funds rate as high as 19%. He raised the Fed funds rate something like 31 times in a year. He raised the Fed fund rate on weekends, right? He, he told Wall Street that he was in charge and he didn't care if people hated him and people hated him. Oh gosh, yeah. But that was in the moment. And now he's revered. He's unfortunately passed her, I think, in the last couple of years. But he is credited with giving us the playbook to break inflation. You have to take the Fed funds rate two to three points above inflation. True inflation, not what they put. They yeah, put true inflation. So CPI, kind of the <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge, seven, nine. Yeah. I corrected for one variable, rent, and it's 11, two. So it's somewhere between 11 and 14%. That's before gas prices and food go nuts because of what's going on. Here's something crazy. And this doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And I actually, I, I want to talk about it right now because if we're going to go into the 80s, this mm -hmm. actually does play out. Okay. So there were a lot of people who took out adjustable rate mortgages and were just loving the ride all the way down. And they have not refinanced because it's been, why would I? I'm fed to that zero. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this ride down. Now, when things spike back up, you're going to see these LIBORs or these, these MTA mutual, you know, these, these yeah. treasury averages loans just shoot through the roof. You know, myself included, a couple of the debt structures that I've taken over are these adjustable rate mortgages. And I, to my credit, I'm like, yeah, I'm writing this all the way down. But as it shoots back up, I'm like, ah, I need to take out some long-term financing. Please and do. Yes. Yes. No, hundred percent. And there are going to be properties that are going to be out there that are going to be opportunities to take over because they're going to shoot up so far that people are going to be like, I can't afford this payment. And one of two things will happen. They'll either sell it, they'll let someone, or actually three things, they'll let someone come over and take over the financing and they can do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Or this is where I think it gets really, really, really good is the, I think the lending environment has learned a lesson from 2008 that loan modifications are a lot more easier to get than they were yeah. in the past. Oh man, that's, that is so true. One the thing, so again, if you haven't researched the 1980s, there was something called the SNL crisis, savings mm -hmm. loan crisis, basically very, very simplistic banks got greedy banks got burned. Sound like the great recession, same deal. <laughs> the thing, it was the same thing except with greater uh, scale. 
Now, to your point, what happened in the, this last uh, pandemic, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> banks are actually doing load mods. They're encouraging them. They're even doing 40 yeah. year load mods. So yeah, <laughs> I, I think, I think a lot of the pain that maybe would have been felt uh, won't be, which is good. So to uh, your point though, like, so some of the properties that we took over, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but I did it anyway. So it's, you know, if you want to do some research uh, you can figure it out. Um, a couple of the properties that we took over, they were in the process of losing their property. They did a loan mod and then we took over the properties after the loan mod. Ah, there you go. And so, um, I mean, life happens. They got, yeah. the loan, they got the loan mod a month later. They decided, oh, we didn't move out. We can't afford payments anymore. And so I have these loan mods that are amazing properties. And <laughs> some of them, we had debt that was forgiven Yeah. on them. And I'm like, these monthly payments, you can't get past this. This is just, nope. it's- Keep them forever. Yeah. Great cash flow. Yeah. It's a great cash flow property. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I think that's that you hit on that I just want to reiterate, I don't think I've said this before. A lot of you, and some of you in apartments, hear me on this. And I had these loans, so I know. So I bought apartment buildings, I don't know, 2010. They had five-year structures and they they adjust their, their arms, right? And because of where the Fed funds rate, they've been going down and down. I had 30, I had no, I had apartment loans with a two on it. 2.75, because again, they were adjusted to some LIBOR metric, right. like zero, the margin was 2.5. So I was paying two and three quarters. Interest only probably. Uh, no, they were fully, oh, they were 24 of your AMs. So I, I was paying, okay. I was paying principal. They were, gotcha. the payment was lower than when I started the, the payment five, when the five-year fixed period, which is not supposed to happen. At least <laughs> that's what banks don't want that to happen. Right. But I spent a year getting out of those loans and taking my 2.75 up to 3.99. Why? Because I know it's coming. Stability. Yeah. I, I now have 30 year fixed at 3.99. Sure, I would have been better at 2.75 for a year. But if my fear is right and the Fed funds rates go to three, four, 500 basis points, Ugh. I mean, that, talk about painful. Well, not to mention that. I mean, I think it's wise if you can see the writing on the wall. Who knows what the lending criteria is going to be? We talked about this. I mean, yeah. it's like, freeze, we're done. Done. Dude, I, yeah. again, I invest in Fresno, California, which in a good market, no problem. But I've been doing it a long time. There are times that Fresno, California has a million people in it will be flagged as a tertiary market. Jeez. Think about it. And if you don't know what that means, it means that this bank won't lend there. Yeah. Think, think about that. Yeah, it, it's it's coming. So again, I think one of the key things of the 80s, the other thing that people don't realize is you can have a real estate crash and prices don't fall because the crash is on a different variable. Paul Volcker, I think it was 83, it might've been 82. Real estate transactions were cut in half because your earlier point, who can afford 30-year money at 19%? Like nobody. Yeah, wage so, inflation hadn't kept up in that it, no. At that point. So yeah. So the only deals that happen, there's always going to be cash buyers. Some people are always just rich. They still do deals because they didn't care about the 19% anyway. Right? right. But think about that. Real we did 6.1 million transactions. What happens if transactions get cut in half? We do three million. And life happens, you need to sell. <laughs> yeah. Go so back and watch video one. Exactly. Here's something crazy about this. So I, I read a book called The No Money Down Formula, and I can't remember who it was by. Um, he had over a hundred different ways of doing creative financing, and he he was born out of the 1980s. Yeah. I wish I could remember his name right now, but he got in trouble. He went he went to prison. <laughs> was it so? I so there's been a couple of people that I remember from the 80s, and again I read the book. So Carlton Sheets wasn't him. Yeah. So he passed away recently. He he was the first guy that I was like, ooh, and I remember being young watching his 30 minute infomercial was awesome. Uh, then there was Robert Allen, Robert G. Allen, I think. Um, he was he did no money down. Then there was there's a couple more that you know ended up wearing orange. Um, yeah, it wasn't Robert Allen. He Robert Allen got was one of this guy's students. Um, I want to say his name was Ken. I posted the um, the book on my on my face on my uh, YouTube channel a couple uh, about a year and a half ago. I read it. It's not in my office. It's at home, but it's a small paperback. Phenomenal book. Let me share with you some of the ideas that I took from it. I mean, these guys were taking out credit card loans to go ahead and, and buy these things. But here's the, one of the really good nuggets that I picked up from it is people don't always want cash for their equity. They want experiences sometimes. 
And so he would buy them vacations. And what he would do is he'd go get a vacation, put it on credit and make payments for the vacation. But he gave them the vacation and they're going to the Bahamas and, and they're touring. And he's like, hey, man, I, yeah, I sold my house, got a vacation out of it. And he's taking over the debt. He's doing very creative stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. The key that I learned from it, though, is, you know, sometimes we have, and you're talking about wholesalers and things like that, that we think that, oh, we got the cash. All they want is cash. It's like, no, cash is not what they want. It's what the cash can give them. What are they looking to do with that money? Yeah. Uh, case in point, we're looking at taking over a property. Um, we're sitting down with the husband and wife last night, and this is a property in, in town. And they're like, you know, we just let them talk. And you're, and you're right with this. Like, just let people talk because we have two ears and one mouth. Let's, you know, listen twice as much as we speak. Mm -hmm. And they shared with us, like, look, we don't want this house. We actually are more farm kind of people. We want some land and we just want to have a, a travel trailer on it so we can come and go and then have our little homestead with our land. And I'm like thinking, well, how much land do you want? He's like, ah, two acres. And we have land that we're, we've been trying to move. And I'm like, hmm, we have the land already. They want a travel trailer. This house has about 300,000 in equity. They're, they're looking at just, hey, can we do a swap here? And I'm like, shoot, we can get this property at a, at a, at a, at a phenomenal price with, with very little input on our, you know, output up from our, our, our personal like savings accounts. And so it's just thinking about what do they want and what do they need? And can I exchange that for the property that I'm looking to buy? Not necessarily cash all the time. Yeah. And I just want to really go back to the fact that I think, um, YouTube University has done folks a disservice the last couple of years, kind of making it hardcore press. Almost to me, the last couple of years have been very boiler room like, because I've been around a long time. I've, I've seen the Yeah, that's through. a good analogy, actually. Right? Yeah, and, you, all these dialers and cold callers and just, yeah. Pound, 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 pound. Yep. And what's coming? The winners are going to be the guys that softer skills. It's uh, sometimes you just got to listen, you got to be creative. Yeah. Again, I remember one of the, one of the deals I did in the great recession was awesome. So I remember I picked up a house. I don't remember the numbers, call it 50 grand mm -hmm. needed 20 grand in work, which we did. I was happy to keep it. It was going to be a great rental for me forever. Yeah. Like three or four months later, I run into an office building. It's actually a loan that we still have. We sold it on, on seller financing. It oh. was on Abbey next to a car dealership, two stories, like 10,000 square feet. Um, but unfortunately, it was empty and then got the um, homeless took it over for a while, right? So yeah. it just destroyed like wall, you know, like you could you could walk through the walls and <laughs> everything was broken. It was it was trash. Yeah. But it was 10,000 square feet corner lot in one of the biggest cities. So the guy was clearly burned out. And I said, he said, uh, I, I think he wanted like 200 grand for it, something like that. Yeah. Uh, which we could have done. But I just listened. And he wanted to be a landlord. He wanted a rental. Huh. So I, I said, huh, here's a house I have. It's, I think we owned it free and clear, or at least I told him if we had debt, we could have paid it off. Right. I said, what would you think about trading? And he's like, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, well, here's the address. Go by. Here's the lease. Um, you still want income because that's what you're telling me, right? This building was supposed to be income for you. And now it's a headache. Right. I, I think the house was probably at the time worth 110, 115, but it was done. It was yeah. leased. It was turnkey. Turnkey. And uh, long story short, we did a swap. We just traded. And, that's beautiful. Yeah. And then I took that building. I did a complete trash out. Didn't repair anything, but just got rid of the trash probably seven, $8,000 because it was a lot of trash Yeah, uh, and painted the outside. And then we sold it for like 275, 295 seller finance. And we got, we got all our cash back that we'd spent plus some, and then we had, we've had a seller financing note since then. So again, just listen, be creative, trade. I love the idea of vacations, cars. I've seen people do stuff with cars. Oh man, we've had... Uh... <laughs> On the, on the, on the, when we have people buying from us, when we're selling them and on, on seller financing term, we've had boats given to us. We've had dump trucks given to us. And I'm like, oh man, I had one guy, this is when I was in South Carolina. He wanted to give me uh, two ARs, his fishing boat and a year's worth of um, ammunition. <laughs> up to, up to like a dollar amount. And I'm like, <laughs> I was definitely in the South. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. So again, I think what's coming up is very much the eighties. Uh, if you're a real estate agent, real uh, mortgage broker, 
it's time to get creative. I think you're going to, I think transactions are going to fall off a cliff that people aren't expecting. I think times will be get better again, but people don't realize Greg Dickerson, who I talked to on Monday, always says good times never last bad times never last. Right. So get ready, you know, fortify your net, fortify your home and then get ready to take advantage. Cause again, recessions are where real money's made. It's true. You know, I'm, in, I'm interested on um, what Matt, the mortgage guy would say about this mm-hmm. or one of your other um, mortgage experts, because sure. during the eighties, I mean, it was, uh, those mortgages were assumable. They're not assumable today. Correct. But I, I'm wondering, you know, if you were to do, do a, a seller carryback, like a silent second, mm-hmm. you know, how they would look at that as far as financing goes. Because the reason I asked that is I'm the building that I'm in right now, I, w- I wanted to purchase it. Hmm. Um, they recently sold it. I didn't buy it. Uh, but the seller was willing to do seller financing and I was going, and I was going to get a, a, a second to pay off his existing debt. Hmm. And um, the bank said, no, we don't want to do this because you're, 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 you're essentially into it for zero zero right. capital yeah and so i'm i, I know commercial is a little bit more stringent but i'm just wondering um as things change and we get into this, this 80s environment mm-hmm. that people are going to be having these second mortgages they're going to be either silent seconds or they're yeah. going to be on paper and you know how are lending how is lending going to change to accommodate that yeah so matt mortgage and i talked about because again i think the world shifted on wednesday of last week watch his videos uh buyers are finally revolting like i'm done too expensive you're hitting me with more rates, more gas, more food, blah, 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 blah. I'm out. So we kept talking. And then we talked about bank statement loans. And basically what happens every time, remember, real estate cycle, lending cycle. Lending cycles don't go to zero. They just get more creative. And then they start solving problems that they did they ignored before, mm. right? So bank statement loans, uh, um, like uh, small businesses, they didn't have to do those loans because they had plenty of owner rock traditional buyers. So they ignored it. Now the owner ox are falling off a cliff. Now let's go talk to self-employed. And we actually said seconds. I actually yeah. asked him. I said, I bet you what's coming next because all this cheap ass money, the secondary market, or actually seconds are going to come back. Because why would you, why would you take your 2.75 first and refi it when you can go get an 8% mm-hmm. second? So exactly. seconds are going to come back. Um, deal structures. Again, banks want to lend. Banks get deposits and their job is to lend it out. Uh, so they, they will definitely get more creative uh, was our you know discussion last week. I hope they do. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. So again, folks, this is not a time to be scared. It is a time to do your homework. I would tell you the boiler room days are numbered. Uh, it's time to get the softer skills. Uh, you need to follow guys like Ryan Nickel who have a heart uh, for both teaching and for helping. How do you want them to do that? Uh, they can either follow me on my YouTube, YouTube channel at Bootstrap REI for Bootstrap Real Estate Investor, or you can just find me on, uh, on Facebook. Very cool, man. Thanks. My pleasure.